Uh, I will focus in the next 20 minutes on some debatable points of uh, blood and blood uh, management uh, of massive bleeding with, re with request to the uh, blood uh, coagulation. So just a reminder, what are the clinical situations when we have a massive blood loss? It was mentioned by Eduardo, all the complications during birth, postpartum hemorrhage, and also in pediatric surgery, we have some situations where we can have huge blood loss, and this is depending from the age of the patient. It starts with very uh, small children having a sacrococcygeal teratoma resection, then it goes to cranial stenostosis surgery, which was mentioned by Christian, and this goes further on until to scoliosis surgery. Blood loss in trauma in pediatric is very rare. We have very, very few uh, children who need blood and blood transfusion before they come to the hospital, and the most uh, children who are suffering from trauma, they are suffering from neurotrauma, and uh, that is the main reason for uh, tra a traumatic death. I mentioned already the sacrococcygeal uh, teratoma resection, which will happen in infants, in very small infants, in newborns, after two, three days of life. And there is a good uh, retrospective uh, case series published in, in pediatric anesthesia, and they could show that they have a high uh, transfusion volume of mean approximately 50 milliliter per kilogram body weight, and the risk of higher transfusion is higher if the gestation age is uh, small, is below 30 weeks, and if they have a quite high Altman score. And I will present, this is a personal experience of a child which was born with 33 weeks, 2.8 uh, kilogram, which I had to care for two years ago, and we have to give, you see here, 170 milliliter of uh, transfusion altogether, red blood cell plasma and platelets. That's also an example where we can have this already in very small children. Well, the question is, and the title is hemostasis and large blood transfusion. But what is a large blood transfusion? Do we have any definition what is a massive bleeding? And the massive transfusion in children, we have a very good uh, definition, which was given by Diop uh, in 2013, and they say that the transfusion of 50% of blood volume within three hours is an indicator for a massive transfusion, and these are the other definitions, transfusion of 100% in 24 hours. If you look at the, um, at, uh, at the women, at partum, you can see that the definition is a bit ambiguous. They say that blood loss more than 1,000 milliliter, more than 1 milliliter with hypovolemia is a postpartum hemorrhage. And if you count this and if you calculate this, this is not more than 20% of the blood volume. So this is the first difference which we have between children, small children, and uh, women on, at birth. But it's not the only difference. But if you look at the coagulation factors, then we can see that in small children, when they are born, the pro coagulation proteins, so the coagulation factors, are very low. This is the adult level here at 1.0. And if you look at children, at newborns, we have 40%, for example, of factor 10 activity. And that will rise during half year approximating the uh, adult level here at uh, nearly half a year. But we don't have only pro-coagulant proteins, we also have anticoagulant proteins, and they are also very low. And that's the reason, because this is very well balanced, that these children do not uh, develop uh, um, pr uh, problems as, for example, thrombosis or bleeding. If you look at women, at pregnant women, we also see that there, is, there are some disorders in, of coagulation. Pregnant women have a quite high fibrinogen, which is more than 100%. 100%. We heard from Eduardo that it is about 3, 4, 5 gram per liter, which is very high. We have a 1,000-fold increase in factor 7, and we have on the factors 8, 9, 10, 12, and von Willebrand factor also more than 100%. And that's the reason why we talk that these uh, women are in a hypercoagulation uh, status. But the normal tests are quite normal. 
And the, and the reason that these women do not develop a disseminated intravascular coagulation is probably the role of the glycocalyx. The endothelial glycocalyx is this layer here uh, containing of glycoproteins, which will protect the endothelium from disseminated intravascular coagulation. Oops. Well, if this is the first uh, conclusion that, uh, that both in small children and in pregnant women, uh, the coagulation is quite different. And probably this is the reason why all these concepts and medications and techniques which we use or which we know from trauma surgery or from uh, military uh, situations will not properly, might not work in these situations. But Massive bleeding can happen expectedly or unexpectedly. And the first measure you have to do is to maintain organ perfusion. And you can do this with crystalloids. And if you do this in small children, we have a very nice review from Robert Simpleman from Hanover, who uh, stated once again that you have to use balanced isotonic electrolyte, electrolyte solutions. Avoid hypotonic electrolyte solutions will that can uh, lead to a dilution and that can lead to a, a brain edema. The other thing is that in many uh, guidelines, for example, the, AB, uh, the Advanced Pediatric Life Support, there is always um, recommended saline, physiologic saline. But physiologic saline is unphysiologic because the pH is very low. It's about 7.0, and it contains a high concentration of chloride ions, and this will cause a metabolic acidosis. A metabolic acidosis is precisely what you don't want for your coagulation because this is a part, together with hypothermia, of the lethal triad, acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. So please avoid uh, natrium chloride, if you use something, use lactate, or if you are afraid of the lactate, which will, can falsificate your lactate values, then you can also use acetate. Organ perfusion, perfusion can also be maintained by colloids, and there is a uh, yeah, recent published Cochrane review in critical ill patients which showed that uh, there is no evidence that colloids are better or worse than crystalloids, there is a big discussion about heterostarch in these patients. You should not use this in a very critically ill patients and also with renal failure. But if you want to use heterostarch in children, you can use it because there is a um, systematic review published in 2018 which came to the conclusion that intravascular volume expansion with low molecular weight, 6%, Heterostarch did not appear to modify renal uh, function, blood loss, or um, dur during perioperative period. But when you use, if you use colloids, you should be aware that they have some effect on the coagulation. If we look here at the clot, you see in the inside the clot, these are the platelets, and this might be the fibrinogen. And if you give, for example, heterostarch, you must be aware that this heterostarch will intrude into the clot, that it will bind between this structure, and that it, this will weaken the uh, hemostatic clot. This was uh, demonstrated quite nicely by Thorsten Haas from Zurich, who gave 50 milliliters of uh, colloids, that was gelatin, albumin, and heterostarch, to children during craniosynostosis, and he could show that, for example, here for head as for heterostarch, there will be a reduction in clot firmness measured by the MCF Rotem of approximately 10%. This is quite significant. The question is, and that is debatable, if that is relevant. Maybe it is. The other thing uh, beside organ uh, perfusion is organ oxygenation. And Eduardo has reported the thresholds for uh, hemoglobin in adults, seven in small children, maybe eight in neonates, teen, 10. And you, can, you should transfuse this in amounts of 10 to 20 milliliter per kilogram body weight. And you should do, of course, a point of care testing, testing the hemoglobin and giving this repeatedly. But you should be aware that if you give um, packet red blood cells, they contain a high concentration of um, uh, 
citrate, and that will reduce your ionized calcium uh, into uh, values below 1.10, and that should be, uh, uh, should be treated by calcium gluconate, uh, gluconate. But both, if you give pectorate blood cells and if you give colloids or crystalloids, will lead to a, a coagulopathy, and it is quite important to treat this dilution coagulopathy by giving plasma factor concentrates, for example, fibrinogen, and also platelets. Plasma. Plasma was mentioned by Christian. We can give this as fresh frozen plasma or dried plasma, the French lyophilized plasma. Is there somebody from French who used that? No. I found this in the literature quite important because fresh frozen plasma will take about 30 minutes to be thawed, and this flip, this lyophilized plasma, is ready within five minutes. That's quite, an, uh, quite important for us. Plasma has a volume effect. Um, it has been uh, associated with TRALI, the transfusion-associated lung injury in recent years, but this has become very uh, um, probably because uh, we use a male policy. This uh, TRALI was associated with uh, HLA antibodies, which came from plasma donated by women, by multipara. They have a high concentration of these antibodies, and if we, have, and if, if we follow this male policy, that means that all, only male donors are allowed to give plasma, then this trial is not very probably now at the moment, and also if we use pool plasma, which we do in uh, the Netherlands. Plasma has a low concentration of coagulation factors. This is dependent how it is worked after, if it is, uh, if it, if it is harvested, in which way you freeze it, how long you store it, and you see that the fibrinogen in plasma might be between 2 and 4 grams per liter, and it has, of course, a decreased uh, factor 5 and factor 8 um, activity. But the plasma has also probably a protecting effect on the endothelial glycocalyx that I mentioned before. And I think we will have in the future probably more data about that. And this might be the reason why plasma has also other effects. And you can say that coagulation factors do not tell the whole story. The other item which is very popular at the moment is the administration of fibrinogen concentrate. Um, you can give this preemptive, which has not very much value, because if you look at uh, the uh, randomized controlled trials, which were done in trauma patients, for example, and in surgical patients, there's not very much evidence that this has a very good effect. And also, I can tell you the only randomized controlled trial I found in postpartum hemorrhage from Anne Wickelsö, and she gave... Um, this, uh, she, she did two groups, 123 with placebo, 124 with female chain group. All women, they had blood loss of more, yeah, of 1.5 liters, and she gave uh, fibrinogen concentrate versus placebo, two gram, uh, to rule out or to, to see if there is an effect. And unfortunately, their conclusions were that they found no evidence that the use of two gram fibrinogen concentrate as preemptive treatment for severe postpartum bleeding uh, has any effect in patients with normal fibrinogenemia. The second step is, and this is also uh, recommended by the EGA guidelines, that this fibrinogen concentrate should be given goal-directed. And for postpartum hemorrhage, we have these recommendations that you should give that if the rotenfiptem A5 is below 12 millimeters, you should give one to... Uh, uh, should give two to four grams of fibrino concentrate. And in children, we also have the recommendation, give it goal-directed if the uh, maximum clot firmness of the rotem fiptem is below seven millimeters, and then give this amount of 50 milligram per kilogram body weight. But if you use rotem and fiptem, you should be aware that the rotem and fiptem, that this technique, that these viscoelastic techniques, also the tech, are very rough techniques, because if you look at the uh, coagulation cascade, if you start with 
tissue factor, factor uh, 5, factor 10, uh, factor 7, factor 10, factor 5, and two fibrinogen. If you do a rotem, this will measure you the whole trajectory. And we, uh, we conclude, for example, uh, if we do a rotem fiptem on the fibrinogen, we conclude that there is low fibrinogen only with the assumption that these factors are quite normal. And as I've shown you before, they are, there might be some differences in these patient groups. Probably that's the reason why this is uh, problematic. If you look at the TEC and the rotem, Fibrinogen, you see there is, for example, for the Rotem, there is a big, uh, yeah, you see that the number of uh, patients are low, high, uh, are false negative and also false positive, and probably this has to do that the other factors should be in normal range. For goal-directed fibrinogen concentrate for postpartum hemorrhage, there is also a, a randomized controlled trial uh, issued by a group from Liverpool. Is there somebody here in? No, unfortunately not, because they randomized um, uh, this um, uh, randomized women with a postpartum hemorrhage of more between 1,000 and 1,500 milliliters. And when the FIPTEM IE5 was below 50 millimeters, they gave fibrino concentrate versus placebo. It is a bit tricky to find out how much they gave. I calculated this uh, according to the formula they indicated in their publication. They gave quite a lot because they used the ideal body weight. And I, in this example, I took a FIPTEM A5 of 13, which is below 15. Then you get 10, and if the uh, woman has an ideal body weight of 70, which is quite high, then you have to give 5 grams of fibrinogen. If it is 56, then you give 4 grams. That's quite a decent dosage. That's quite a good um, design, and it's quite interesting what they found. And they found a, a, a blood loss of one one and a half liter in the placebo group, and here there was no difference. And unfortunately, all the, uh, this group could not find any improvement if they give fibrinogen goal directed. So what that means that we need also in this population, we need more uh, good performed randomized controlled trials, also multi-center trials to get mer more information if this will work or if this will not work. In children, we have only one randomized controlled trial by, made of, performed by Torsten Haas from Switzerland, and he made two groups during craniosynostosis, one with a rotium fipton of eight millimeter, lower than 8 millimeters and lower than 13 millimeters. He gave, according to them, fibrinogen concentrate 30 milligrams per kilogram during craniosynostosis and also during scoliosis surgery. And he could demonstrate that this uh, could uh, reduce the uh, perioperative blood loss markedly in the craniosynostosis group, but not in the uh, scoliosis surgery group. But you have to conclude that this was not only done by the FIPTEM, because he did also a factor 13 analysis, and he administered also factor 13. Also for small children or for children for pediatric surgery, we need more good data, more good trials to get any information to uh, decide whether uh, the application of goal-directed fibrinogen concentrate is useful or not. Last now, one word to tranexamic acid. I left this to Christian because he did a lot, uh, he did some research about craniosynostosis surgery. And if you look at the woman trial, which was a multi-center trial, 20,000 women who uh, uh, had a postpartum hemorrhage and who received um, tranexamic acid, one gram in the first three hours and one gram uh, if uh, the bleeding uh, continued, we could demonstrate, or they could demonstrate quite, uh, quite quite uh, marked, quite remarkable, that this will lead to a reduction of um, mortality. But if you give the tranexamic acid later, after three hours, the mortality is all, is, will be enhanced. This is a woman trial, and if you uh, match and if you uh, put these uh, data together with the crash 
uh, trial, you will have a marked enhancement of uh, mortality if you give tranexamic acid in a late period of bleeding. This leads to the question, is that a good drug? Because uh, it seems to be a magic drug which you can give intravenously, you can give it topical, uh, locally, you can also uh, nebulize uh, tranexamic acid. And if you followed the lunch session today, we had some critical remarks from Heiko Lear, which is very interesting to see because we need indeed more knowledge about the dosage, the pharmacokinetics, the mechanism of action, and also the clinical applications. So I can recommend you this um, narrative review which was issued two weeks ago. Uh, I think there are some gaps, knowledge gaps, which should be filled. Uh, rather to give you a conclusion, I would uh, conclude this session with this gentleman. I hope you know who it is. He traveled to Rome 230 years ago. Who is it? That is Johann Wilhelm uh, von Goethe, um, who was a ge famous German writer. He was a scientist, and he also was a medical doctor. And he always claimed that the language of science should be poetry. And probably that's why he issued this uh, very remarkable sentence in German, Blut ist ein ganz besonderer Saft. And if I translate this, this is blood is quite a peculiar juice. I think we should remember that when we transfuse blood to a patient. Thank you very much.